move on to Dr. Chris Moran, who is the Senior Legal Counsel at the Wellcome Trust, and he's specialising on intellectual property there, and he's going to talk to us about what charitable funders think about this and how we should exploit IP appropriately in their views. Right, um, as some of you will appreciate, there's been a, a change to the, uh, the advertised schedule. So if any of you were thinking of sneaking out before I presented at the end, then I, I apologise that you have to sit through this. I'll try and make it entertaining for you. Uh, so um, my name's Chris Moran. I'm from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, I'll be giving a uh, perspective on personalised medicine and IP from a charitable funder. Uh, at the Trust, I'm an IP lawyer. And you can tell I'm a lawyer because I'm the only one giving a disclaimer at the beginning of my speech. <laughs> uh, which is just to say that, that some of what I'm talking about, in fact a lot of it, uh, is my own personal view and not necessarily uh, the formal position of the Wellcome Trust. Also, if time allows, I may talk about some uh, changes to some of our policies we're anticipating making. Uh, and anything that's a change uh, is always sort of subject to final approval, so it may in fact not happen. So, um, who are we? Uh, we're a, a global charitable foundation. We're both uh, politically and, quite importantly, financially independent, um, which does mean that we can act in a way that's slightly different to some other charities. We're uh, very privileged to have uh, a very large endowment, uh, which means we don't need to go out raising money um, by uh, shaking tins and things. Um, our origins, I think, are worth touching on uh, briefly. Uh, so, um, we go back to uh, the days of Sir Henry Wellcome, the gentleman here with the, the fabulous moustache. Um, in uh, uh, 1880, uh, he moved to the UK and set up a pharmaceutical company with a friend. Uh, they were very successful, turned that into a, uh, a large uh, multinational enterprise, and he became a, a leading figure in the pharmaceutical uh, industry in a day. When he died in... Uh, I forget where he died, I think 19, early 1930s, I think. Um, he left all of his shares in the company to a charitable trust. Uh, so the charity owned the pharmaceutical company and for a long time just reinvested profits in, in research. Uh, and then over time, uh, the charity decided to divest some of those shares. Uh, at some point, the, the company merged with Glaxo to be Glaxo Welcome, which is now part of GlaxoSmithKline. But by 2001, we'd sold out of, of shares, so we're now independent from, from pharma. But it's worth pointing out that, that everything we do in terms of funding fundamental research, all our policy work, all our approaches to, uh, to open access, owes its existence to effectively big pharma. Uh, and they do get a bit of stick uh, sometimes from people, uh, rightly or wrongly. But it's worth identifying occasionally that, that big pharma does a great job, and if you uh, couple it with uh, philanthropy, it can be a very powerful force indeed. And I think we still see that with the likes of Gates today. Um, so, what's Wellcome's mission? Uh, we exist to uh, improve health for everyone by helping great ideas to thrive. And normally I skip straight over this because it's kind of our corporate slogan. Um, but I want to touch on the word everyone here in the context of personalised medicine. Uh, because one of the, the slight concerns we have about personalised medicine is that perhaps it's an uh, expensive approach to therapy uh, and we have concerns over whether actually is everyone going to be able to benefit from it. Uh, to what extent uh, are the benefits of personalised medicine ever going to be able to flow down to lower and middle income countries? Uh, and for us, we, we'd certainly like to see more data on uh, the costs and the cost effectiveness of personalised medicine uh, before we really get behind it and to see models um, indicating how it can benefit everyone and not just um, those in the developed world or even the wealthy in the developed world who can access uh, the necessary tests. Uh, on the flip side though, uh, there is a lot to be said for personalised medicine in terms of it providing benefits to people who uh, previously didn't experience them. We heard earlier about um, apparently quite woeful ability of major drugs to treat people who are given them. Uh, and to the extent that personalised medicine can broaden the spread of people who benefit from existing drugs, that's obviously a good thing. So how do we try and achieve our benefit of bringing great health to everyone? Well, we fund uh, a very large number of academics, uh, 14,000 in 70 different countries. 
and we're currently on target to invest five billion uh, over the next five years. This slide's rather old. Uh, last year was the first year and we, we managed to hit our target of uh, spending over a billion, a billion pounds. Uh, the bulk of our funding goes to uh, individuals and teams who are looking at fundamental questions uh, relating to health and disease. But we're still interested when we get our grant applications on the fundamental side uh, to see how it could potentially affect um, major health needs in the future. So we're always looking for how is the research we fund uh, potentially going to improve health in the future. We do also support uh, a good number of people who are busy turning those great ideas and discoveries uh, into the next generation of technologies, treatments and diagnostics, the latter being particularly relevant for, um, for personalised medicine. Uh, and our innovations division is planning on spending 500 million over the next five years and we're planning on moving away slightly from our historic role as a gap funder uh, and instead uh, getting more heavily involved with perhaps a smaller number of projects but seeing them through uh, for longer in the life, uh, life cycle. And we funded uh, new drugs, diagnostic uh, uh, tests, devices uh, and also therapy or approaches to try and uh, change patient behaviours. Uh, we've been involved in genomics for a long time. Uh, we set up the Sanger Institute in 1993. Uh, that formed part of the, uh, the hu Human Genome Project. Uh, Sanger, I think, mapped about 30% of the, the genome there. Uh, and we see our backing as being instrumental in making sure that that data is publicly available uh, and could be used by other researchers. And we continue to fund Sanger today. We also fund uh, a range of other sort of community resources. Uh, we support UK Biobank and things like the Twins Registry at King's. And we really see these community resources and data sets as being a fundal, a fundamental underpinning resources for personalised medicine. Um, it's not the glamorous end of the spectrum where you're doing the trials and launching the new products, but uh, we see it critical to uh, the progress of this kind of research. Uh, shifting gears now and, and talking a little bit about uh, IP. Um, I probably won't go through all of this in detail. I get the sense that there's a reasonably high level of knowledge here uh, about what's patentable and what's not, and I don't want to uh, tread on the toes of the next speaker who may be covering some of this as well. Um, but broadly in Europe, uh, to highlight that if you isolate uh, a gene uh, from the human body by means of a technical process, then you can patent that, notwithstanding that uh, that sequence or partial sequence may match something um, or be identical to something in the natural environment. Obviously, you still have to meet uh, the novelty inventive step and industrial application tests, um, but uh, at least in theory, gene patenting is still, uh, still on the table. And that's broadly in line with Wellcome's current IP policy. So we're supportive generally of patenting, uh, and we're supportive of patenting uh, gene sequencing where sufficient information is provided at the time to identify uh, how that sequencing question can be used to improve human health. We definitely don't support the flip side of that, which is the mere patenting of gene sequences, absent that information of how it can be used, which is broadly now uh, in line with the EU approach. So, um, horribly crude bit of analysis for me done in uh, about 10 minutes using Google, uh, but is, is the uh, EU approach working? I've lifted some data from the EPO website here. Um, and looked at their medical technology category of patent applications. And back in 2007, there were 9,451 patent applications filed in their medical technology category, which, to my mind, is the one most closely aligned with personalised medicine. And by 2016, that had increased by about 30%. So, on a very crude assessment, that indicates to me that the industry is doing reasonably well. Uh, contrast that over the same period with pharmaceutical applications and they've dropped by about 10%, perhaps indicating some of the challenges that, uh, that pharma are having um, with getting their, uh, their drugs, oh, well, not necessarily approved, but get the increased regulatory burden of clinical trials. Uh, I'll contrast that a little bit now with the US and Prometheus and Myriad. And I've realised with my did Prometheus and Myriad go too far uh, title, I've probably given a bit of a spoiler there that I think that's the case. But anyway, in, in Mayo, um, it was all about the correlation between metabolite levels and drug efficacy, and that was seen as the, if you like, the invention. 
Uh, and the Supreme Court said, well, that's a, nothing more than a, nat a natural process. And then they looked at all the other aspects of the claim and said, well, all the other aspects, uh, administering a drug, measuring metabolite levels, uh, that's all just conventional stuff. It doesn't add anything uh, substantially or significantly more to the invention, so it remains a, a law of nature and is patent ineligible under Section 101. And that contrasts, to my mind, quite heavily with some of the stuff going back to the 50s about everything under the sun made by man. Uh, so it got a bit of commentary at the time that um, it was a major shift, and Farmer was quite, uh, quite agitated about that. And contrast in, in Europe where no opposition was, was filed. So we were left with, with this sort of two-step test. Uh, are the claims directed to a patent ineligible concept? And if they are, is there anything else in the claim that, that takes it away from that? Many people hoped, I think on the farmer side, that the, um, the Federal Circuit would in some way ride to the rescue. Um, and in fact, they kind of did the opposite in the Ariosa and Sequinom case. I have some sympathy here for Sequinom, I think. Um, they'd invented a, um, an entirely new non-invasive uh, test looking for cell-free fetal DNA within a, a pregnant mother's blood and basically being able to isolate the, the fragments of DNA that came from the father, showing that they were distinct, obviously, from the mother, amplifying those and using them to detect uh, conditions in the, in the fetus. Um, the Federal Circuit, however, rigidly applied the, the two steps they were given from Prometheus. Step one, they said, well, is it directed to a law of nature? And they said, well, it starts with cell-free DNA in the maternal blood, and it ends with detecting... Um, paternally inherited cell-free DNA. And both of those things are natural phenomena. So part, uh, part one of the test was met, so they had to go on to part two and say, is there anything else about it that really changes the game? Uh, and unfortunately, step two was defined quite broadly by the Supreme Court, uh, and actually in practice, all of the steps taken by Sequinom in their case were relatively standard. Uh, preparing samples, amplification of DNA and its detection were all well known in other areas. Uh, so uh, the Federal Circuit felt it had to, uh, to find that the patent was invalid. But you could see that um, they were incredibly unhappy uh, about having to do that. And I'll read out a couple of quotes. Uh, one judge said, I joined the court opinion in validating the claims of the patent only because I am bound by the sweeping language of the test set out in Mayo. This case represents the consequence, perhaps unintended, of that broad language in excluding a meritorious invention from the patent protection it deserves and should have been entitled to retain. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so clearly, uh, the court wasn't entirely happy with the way the Supreme Court had defined things uh, and the decisions it was, in, it was required to make. Uh, and another quote is, but for the sweeping language in the Supreme Court's decision in Mayo, I see no reason in policy or statute why this breakthrough invention should not be deemed patent eligible. So there's definitely a bit of a dispute going on different courts in the US as to what the, uh, the relevant Section 101 test ought to be. Uh, and in, more importantly, the impact that has on inventions. Uh, a further case in the US, Myriad, which has already been discussed, so I won't go into, into the background of that other than to say that it essentially means that genomic DNA is unpatentable even after it's been isolated in the US. But I want to touch on a slightly different aspect of the case, which is why it was brought about in the first place. Um, what motivated, in my reference here, the Association of Molecular Pathology uh, to get involved with patent revocation? Normally, it's uh, companies slugging it out for commercial advantage, but this was obviously quite different. And I think, um, whilst they said in their press releases it was very much kind of dealing with the ethical question of should genes be patented, um, I can't help but suspect that there were other things in play there as, as well around, if you like, the public reaction to the way Myriad was behaving. Um, and some of these objections in the, in the, in the commentary were around um, restriction of access to the testing so that people couldn't get uh, a second opinion test. Uh, the way in which uh, holding a really tight monopoly meant that no, no other people could be improving uh, on the test design, so it was slowing down test improvements. Uh, there were criticisms about the way in which um, it was blocking reduced access uh, to the diagnostics for poorer countries. We've heard already today about the issue of Myriad not sharing the data. 
And I think there's an issue here about the distinction between an IP monopoly and your IP policy or your IP practice. Um, and I suspect of all the many gene patents that could have been chosen uh, to prove a point about ethics, it was this one, not because of the IP monopoly, but because of the way they went about enforcing it. Um, and there's a, there's a quote I remember um, from my, my days of training about, uh, I think it's tough cases make bad law. Uh, and I wonder whether it's one of those. There was a lot of public outrage about Myriad. The Supreme Court perhaps felt it was under pressure to do something about it, changed the law. But of course, now that law is also being applied to people like Sequinom, who had produced uh, a perfectly decent, to my mind, invention, uh, maybe weren't uh, misusing uh, their monopoly in quite the same way. So are, are these cases in the US having a chilling effect? Um, certainly industry will say that they are, uh, to which the rebuttal, I suppose, would be, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? So it would be nice to get some more kind of concrete data on this. And I don't think this is concrete, but it's perhaps a start. Uh, so Bernard Chow in the University of Colorado looked at USPTO office actions. Uh, over 85,000 office actions relating to uh, over 39,000 patent applications. And the, in the era before, uh, era before Prometheus, back in 2011, only 5.5% of those objections were based on Section 101. Uh, and in the relatively rare event that an examiner uh, did object on the basis of Section 101, the applicant had a, a better than average chance of overcoming, overcoming those objections, and in fact succeeded in about 71% of cases. Moving now to uh, the era after Prometheus, well, suddenly the, the rejection rate shoots up, so that 22.5% of objections are based on Section 101. And at the same time, the ability to overcome those crashes down to about 30%. So you've got a fourfold increase in the chance of uh, facing a, a rejection uh, and less than half the chance when you get an objection of being able to overcome it. So the concern to my mind is when you have a big uh, shift in approach to, to patenting, how does that filter down to investment uh, in producing new, uh, new treatments, new diagnostics that patients ultimately can benefit from? And I think maybe... Um, further work is required to see whether these kind of uh, decisions are in fact changing uh, the investment landscape or the desirability of perhaps creating a new diagnostic company. Um, a concern for us obviously is that they might be, so maybe less people are going to create a diagnostic company now than were before. That would to my mind be inherently bad because it's those diagnostics that are being developed that patients are going to benefit from. If that's not actually happening, if the, the, the R&D is still carrying on worldwide, then there's also a potential downside in that without that uh, market exclusivity uh, and that mon IP monopoly in the US, the development costs for those diagnostics and new products have still got to be recouped from somewhere. They're less likely to be recouped in the US because there, with no IP monopoly, you're going to face challenges more rapidly and the, uh, the costs inevitably are going to come down. So that, I think, shifts the burden to Europe and other jurisdictions where there is protection. And effectively there, patients and health systems are likely to be paying more than they would otherwise have done. And so effectively be subsidising patients in the US. So I think there is this, uh, to my mind, uh, inherent undesirability of having uh, markedly different approaches to IP in these two major jurisdictions. I'll talk now a little bit about uh, Wellcome's approach to funding. And to be honest, this largely applies uh, across the board, not just to personalised medicine. But when we get an application for funding, uh, we're primarily looking for a great idea. So we're looking for some really good science, whether it's on the fundamental research side or whether it's in relation to translation. Uh, we're also looking for the potential to address a major health need. Our mission is to improve health, not just to fund research. So we want to be able to, to hear a story uh, about how it could improve health down the line. And more so in the future, we're uh, considering all the different research outputs that our, our funded uh, uh, recipients may be generating. So in the past, things have primarily related around or uh, revolved around uh, publications. So academics get the grant funding, they want to publish more papers so they can get more funding, so they can publish more papers so they can get more funding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the best, with the best will in the world, uh, no one ever got made better from any condition 
because someone had published a research paper. It's always the next step that leads to a medicine or a new kind of treatment. So we're really trying to encourage our award holders to think broadly around what it is they've created uh, and what are the possibilities for using that to go to the next step and actually improve health. Uh, we've, fa we've had for a long time a data management and sharing plan requirement, which basically means that if someone's creating a large data set with our funding, they have to tell us about how they're going to make that data available. Um, where are they going to put it? How can people access it so it could be a resource for other researchers? And we plan on extending that to cover things like software, but also research materials, so uh, new antibodies, new cell lines, um, looking at ways of making sure that all the outputs from research are shared and are, are used in a way that maximises their potential to, to improve health. Um, and we're planning on trying to link up our, our sharing approach uh, with our IP and commercialisation approach and really identifying these as two different paths uh, any researcher can go down uh, to delivering impact. They can choose to go down an IP and commercialisation route or they can um, choose to share their research outputs. And effectively what this hides uh, is the third option of just keeping that output for themselves or for their research team or for their university as a local resource that they can sort of uh, have themselves and play with. Um, we, we really want to make sure that um, the impact from research outputs are maximised, uh, which means getting it out there and using it in some way. On the IP commercialisation side, there'll probably be a presumption of patenting, uh, unless there's some reason why timely commercialisation of that patentable invention um, is not going to happen. We're not looking at patents for patent's sake. We're not trying to drive patent numbers. Um, if it's clear that a patent is just going to sit on the shelf and not be commercialised, we'd rather it not be filed in the first place. Uh, the alternative is a policy decision to share, so an affirmative decision. We've got a patentable invention, but it can be more impactful if we just share it and disclose it to the world. We see IP very much as a tool, um, and for us it's all about commercialisation. And it's all about commercialisation to maximise health benefits and not necessarily to maximise uh, investment returns and revenues. And that's obviously where we're going to be approaching things slightly differently from, uh, from industry. On the output and sharing side, we're looking for information about when is our award holder going to make their, their data sets available. And as a minimum, we require data underpinning a research paper to be published at the time of publication of that paper because we believe that if that data is available, people can use it to, uh, to verify the results in that paper and can use it themselves uh, for other purposes. We're encouraging data to be uh, deposited in recognised subject area repositories. We believe strongly that data needs to be discoverable. Uh, it's no use putting it on a university website if no one knows it's there, uh, and it needs to be accessible. We also push the use of persistent identifiers for online content and the adoption of standard uh, open source software licenses, recognising that any kind of bespoke uh, software licenses a university might apply to content is inevitably going to slow down uh, use of that content. So that comes to the question of, in any given scenario, is the best option to commercialise or is it to share? Um, and there is no single answer to that. I can't uh, provide a kind of a magic bullet that answers the question in each case but we provide some guidance and leave it up to our grant holders to make, uh, make an effective decision. But factors which may play a part is, can the output be used right away? Uh, if it can, that suggests that getting it out there and sharing it is going to be the most impactful solution. If it doesn't, if it needs further development funding, then perhaps commercialising and using IP as a tool to bring in that funding uh, would be preferred. We also want to encourage uh, thinking about sustainable long-term use of something. So say an academic uh, develops a, a research reagent or an antibody. Um, academic may say, well, if anyone asks me, I'll produce a sample of antibody and, and send it off to them. For us, that's probably going to be suboptimal. Maybe it works for the first few months or years, but then that academic's going to be working on something else. Maybe that, that research team separates, goes in different ways, an academic leaves the university, there's no guarantee that other researchers will A, know about that resource, or, or B, be able to tap into it in the future. So, and it may be preferable then to license that technology or that material 
to a company whose mission it is, is to, to sell and advertise and distribute that for the long term. Uh, we asked the question of would things be more impactful if they were part of another product? This might apply to a little bit of code, for example, that someone generates. Uh, are they better off um, putting that on their website and licensing it separately? Or would it be more impactful if it was embedded within a commercial piece of software um, that other people are using and it could be rolled out more widely? We, um, we've heard today already about timelines of how long it can take to get uh, agreements done, it's kind of six to nine months. And sometimes I think that's optimistic. Um, so again, uh, we, we think about how quickly can things be done. If it's going to take a very long time to commercialize, maybe sharing is the best way. Uh, and finally, things like marketing and distribution. Do you need to be able to uh, market and distribute something with a commercial partner to maximize impact? And then if considering all those factors you decide or the academic decides to go down the commercialization route, these are the sorts of things that Welcome is going to be interested in. Uh, we want to know uh, what are the resources and the experience of the partner? Are they going to be an effective partner in unlocking the benefit of this technology? We may ask for step-in rights if the partner is going to be in charge of patent filings. Uh, as a charity, we're subject to, uh, to charity law and the requirement that charitable assets are used primarily for public benefit. So any private benefits flowing to the partner have to be only, only incidental. And if anyone can explain to me exactly what that means, do please come and talk to me after the end of this presentation. Um, it's a challenge for us to make sure that in each case, not too much reward is going to a partner. Uh, res uh, reserving research licenses is very important. We want research to carry on. Um, we want to maximize impact, not necessarily maximize revenue. Uh, we want delays to publications to be minimized. There's maybe this perception that if you choose commercialization, it means you don't have to publish. We're really encouraging the companies we work with uh, to think about what information can they afford to disclose that perhaps won't jeopardize uh, their commercialization strategy. If you think back uh, to some of the cases we've talked about in the past, and Myriad in particular, if they'd adopted a much more open approach, if they granted licenses to other people to do um, sort of second testing, if they'd shared some of their data, question whether they would have faced the, the case that they did. They certainly, I think, would have uh, looked more uh, responsible in the eyes of the public. Um, we're always very careful about uh, exclusivity to trust-funded inventions, uh, and we require diligence obligations where that's done. And for our, to our mind, they have to be testable and measurable. No use just saying that the commercial partner will use reasonable endeavours, because no one knows what that means. Um, and there's no way you can Re reasonably be inspected to, uh, to enforce it. A university arguing with a pharma company that they haven't exercised reasonable endeavours is just a hiding to nothing. But if you've got mar milestones and targets and you can measure those, it's much easier. Uh, and finally, I've mentioned before sort of interest in um, being able to benefit everyone with this technology. So it's always going to be a concern to us to what extent can the benefits flow down to lower middle income countries. Uh, and for ELMIC access, we might talk about, can you divide territories? Can you give the commercial partner licenses in the developed world and retain for ELMICs the rights to exploit for a sort of a, uh, a non-profit partner? Uh, alternatively, if you license the IP worldwide, can you have it flowing back if they don't exploit it in those countries? Or perhaps op uh, optimally, can you put in requirements that the, uh, the, the pharma company or the diagnostic company you're working with is obliged to supply products at or close to the cost uh, in certain territories. And that, of course, only works if the cost is such that uh, it's even going to be affordable at, at that level. So, in summary, uh, Welcome supports personalised medicine as one approach to improving health. For us, access, particularly access uh, in lower middle income countries, is going to be an important consideration. We'd like to see some more data on cost effectiveness of this. We're always driven by uh, data and data-driven decisions. Uh, and a lot of what I've spoken about is somewhat anecdotal. So love to see some data on uh, personalised medicine and how cost effective it is. Uh, we feel strongly that, that fair and equitable use of IP uh, is going to be important in dealing with moral considerations. And I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, around public engagement to explain 
why in some cases it's okay to patent a gene uh, and the benefit that's, that that can lead. Um, anecdotal again, but I, I've heard that if Wellcome asks patients, can we have uh, all of your data for scientific research, they almost universally say yes. Uh, if asked the question of can Big Pharma have access to your data, they almost universally say no. Uh, and yet, if they understood the role and the necessity of pharma in delivering products, maybe they would start to think a little bit differently. So we think there's a very important role in public engagement. Uh, similarly, there's lots of work to do on uh, open access, on identifying uh, significant data sets, making sure that they can be, uh, they can be found and accessed, and likewise with the research tools that underpin the developments of things like personalised medicine. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to note, I think, how judicial decisions in the US may flow down to things like investment. Are venture capitalists in the US now going to put their money behind startup diagnostic companies, or are they going to go off and just support fintech or, or some other thing because they can get a better rate of return? Um, and whilst I don't expect my talk today to change anything, uh, I just want to make the point that I, I think it's inherently undesirable to have materially different IP standards between major jurisdictions, and I think it can drive some uh, unhealthy dynamics. And that's me.